All right, Joel Gostin here from joelgostin.com. Uh, for the interview to come, I'm very excited to be joined by someone who just released uh, one of the best albums I've heard in years. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to dive into it a bit with its creator. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome from attrition, Mr. Martin Bowes. Martin, welcome. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, I'm great. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Likewise, likewise. Um, yeah, as I said, I, I love the new album, which is called The Black Mariah. Um, yeah. And I've been following attrition for um, a good 20 years. And I'll get into how I first got to know of you a bit later. But yeah, uh, I, I really enjoy the new album. I think it's certainly one of the best you've done under the attrition banner. Um it's my understanding this album has been quite a few years in the making. If I understand or remember yeah. correctly, it was I remember seeing an interview you did maybe two years ago where it appeared the album was kind of nearing the finish line. Um obviously a bit of extra time was needed. Um what led to the sort of um I guess maybe eight year, nine year gap between releases? It's actually, yeah, it's actually nine years. The last one I did was the uh, millions of the mathless dead which was a world war one poetry uh with obviously to music which i did with annie hogan <clears throat> and that was it's under attrition um and that was yeah that was 2015 um and then yeah this is why everyone's asking this question <laughs> and uh so it's nine years i mean there's the firstly i think most bands that have been going 40 years do tend to slow down i think and I don't want to just keep saying the same thing. So I think, um, although saying that, I've got really already on to the next one. But um, it was, part, I think, a little bit of that, because I get fussy, you know, I get like, I don't want to just bang the track out tomorrow, you know, really. Perhaps I should sometimes. But uh, there's a bit of that. And then there was loads of things. There was obviously COVID. I mean, I was like, we had all tours our first whole south american tour blown out and loads of things and i didn't to be honest i wasn't very enthusiastic for do it for a year or two with that um and i i run the studio here the cage and i do a lot of mastering and production so actually during covid i got busier than ever because mm. no one could tour so they were recording so i actually got really busy i was a bit distracted um uh so there's lot of that reason and also the big thing really was i my wife kerry who i've dedicated the album to uh who's who passed away on uh, to january 2022 she she we had a lot of trouble and unfortunately she had suffered she was alcoholic and she suffered a lot from that and it ended up in a lot of uh yeah a lot of bad times really and that that again was it was a big that was the main thing uh you know it's one of the things i don't really i haven't i don't go talking about it everywhere but um and then we split up we got divorced we, we did stay friends which was great um but it in the end it, it killed her you know so um that was terrible and actually i couldn't finish the lyrics because every, every album i do it's very personal I, I always think of them as a kind of audio photo album of that part of my life and I really couldn't it was weird not weird it's a it makes sense but I couldn't finish the last tracks that particularly the lyrics uh and then she, she died and I finished them straight away it was almost like that was an end uh which but yeah like I say it isn't weird it actually makes sense doesn't it and so that happened and then the final thing was I was going to get there was a record label it was going to put out the vinyl version of the of the Black Mariah, and then they strung me along for months and months, so because it was ready almost a year ago actually. So um, I just said, okay, I'll just forget it. I'll do it. So I did it. Uh, in fact, I'm still waiting for the vinyl, but it'll be here in a week, I think. So uh, yeah, so it was a it was a long journey, but actually, you know, funny enough, it's created. A, I think it's created a more interest in a way. If we, if it had an album out last year, it wouldn't have had the same impact. Mm. So, um, and I was always doing shows, and um, I did some side projects as well. Uh, one called Engram, 
did an album that came out in 2018. And then I was doing another sort of improvised electronic band called DPM, which it was more live and improvised sort of in the studio. We didn't do a lot. But, so I was doing other things, you know, I wasn't lazy around. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Out, I'm glad, and we did have the singles as well over the last couple of years, and that was, I think, when you saw that interview. I think we had a we, we had the single out then, and um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad it's come out, and it's I'm pleased with it, and it seems to be getting a good reaction. So quite pleased with that as well. Wonderful, but, yeah. Well, it's great to see the album get to the point now where it's of the world you know um yeah i'm i'm really loving this one um i, I love all of your work um but this album in particular um is really hitting me hard i think there's a lot to take in production wise there's a lot to take in sonically and there's a lot to take in just material wise and and some of the things you're saying on this album um one element that really makes the album shine in my view would be um all those amazing female vocals you have on on the album um tell me a bit about the the ladies who participated in the creation of the record yeah uh well yeah there's a bit of a story with it because originally for years for 20 years since the beginning my i worked with julia uh julia waller who was the original singer um and so and then she just she didn't want to do music anymore and this was literally yeah, about 20 years ago so i tried different singers and uh would work with different people but i never really found and i got some good ones but there was never the same kind of long term it was more they might be in other bands or whatever you know and i'd work with them as guests um and did more myself but so this this album, I decided I'm going to have a, all, a whole a, array of different guests. So it's not even the same person on every track. It work, it'll be what works. So uh, there's, I, really, I mean, on The Great Derailer, there's Emka from Black Nail Cabaret, and she's amazing. So um, she's, uh, I met her when we played in Budapest, because she's from near there in Hungary. Uh, 2017, we played with them. So she was on that, and then there was other people. There was uh, Evelyn um, from uh, Vaseline, the Dutch band. Um, so oh, there was uh, Eliza Day, who's a Mexican soprano, uh, opera singer, really. And she was over in Europe doing some opera things, and she came and did some vocals. So she's doing like the solo stuff. Um, so yeah, there was quite there's a, a good array of different vocals, uh, and then at the end of it, because uh, Julia's uh, my original singer, her brother Ashley, uh, he lives in, actually lives in San Francisco, so but he he hadn't done anything. He was in the band until 1986, and he hadn't done anything. He did actually do one gig in San Francisco with us in uh, 2008, actually. But he hadn't really, he basically came back to do stuff again. He just really missed it. And uh, he can afford to just fly over now. <laughs> but uh, so because he joined again, she got keen, Julia got keen to do, to rejoin. So this was about a year and a half ago or something like that. Uh, and we played at the Infest Festival in, it's in, in the UK, Industrial Festival, which is it's a good one. Uh, a bit, a bit like probably like Cold Waves or something. But it's like but a bit smaller, maybe. Mm. But yeah, the same sort of band. So she, we that was the first gig. So she's come back. So she's on two of the tracks on the album. So I'm almost. I was just thinking about it. So I was like having all these different vocalists that kind of like attracted her back or something. <laughs> I don't know, but it's worked really well. And um, so we've we've really got the original lineup back together, which we didn't have since since 86 mm. um, so uh, but we have one or two other people that come and join us actually Ashley can't always make every gig bit of a trek so uh, we have uh, there's a, one or two of the synth players sometimes a different singer but uh, yeah so it's it's worked well so but I think the next album will be more back to the original lineup so 
it might be a bit quicker as a result because I did, I tend to I was doing everything really arranging everything. So uh, yeah, so that's kind of the story really. Um, how how amazing is it that all these years later, you know, you're returning to some of the more familiar faces who've been involved over the years. You know, it's one of the magical things about kind of sticking the you know staying the course because you don't know who's going to come around again. You know, so yeah. It's kind of yeah, it's like it's funny because Ashley used when we started, I would do uh, drums and effects and do the mixing and vocals. But I, I'm not. I don't think of myself as very musical, really. I just make noises, you know. But he used to do the bass lines in the early sort of records, and I always liked them. And then I, whenever I was doing it myself after he'd stopped, I used to think, oh, what would he have done? And you know, and I'd be listening. But now it's full circle. He's come back and he's listening to what I do. And he's like, really going, wow, that's great. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, it's funny. It's sort of, he influenced me and I've now influencing him. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah I like that. Um, you mentioned you uh, recorded the album at your home studio. Um, yeah. And even on my not so great laptop, um, the album just sounds so powerful and strong production wise, as I said earlier, it's a very clear sounding record with a lot of things going on. You know, there's certain layers, yeah. music um, because you have created music for well over four decades now. I'm curious, how how does current technologies most impact what you're able to bring to an attrition project um, in terms, you know, whether yeah. it's sonics or or just being able to add all these different elements to a particular number yeah i mean we, when we started out um well we went to a, i think it's 1981 i think we went to a little four track studio to do a couple of demos you know <laughs> and then i got some money when i left i had a job <laughs> i had a proper job for a little bit and uh i got i bought a little four track you know porter studio the cassette one back in those days um and some equipment I got an eight to eight drum machine which was pretty good uh so we had some basic stuff and we did record a lot of tracks in our that would be ba basically it was mostly in ashley's bedroom in his parents house we'd go around and do it so we did we were knocking out loads of tracks really quickly we didn't know what we were doing we just enjoyed making you know making noises with our analog we'd have a couple of analog synths and a drum machine and some tape delay and things uh, cheap mic so it was all it was just like anyone does really starts out so we did that and then as we started to release records we started labels would pay for us to go to studios so uh, obviously the quality generally you know went up and we but also we got to learn a lot um but in some ways i like i didn't used to know that when things were distorted i used to just like the sound you know uh which i still do but yeah, I didn't realise actually I wasn't recording it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's good. In fact, sometimes you lose that as you get, you know, now, as you get to know how things should be, and you kind of lose that naivety, I think. Uh, but, yeah, so I sort of learned, we learned it going in the studios during the 80s. and But then it, by the 90s, I thought, you know, I can't I can't record unless a label pays for it. And all the money was going on the recordings. And like, it, you know, we'd release a record, it would sell a few thousand and it would just basically go be eaten up by the studio. So I thought the answer to this is to have my own studio. Um, so uh, in the 90s, yeah, I, I remember I just, just used to do lots of little part time jobs to get the money and just put it all in and then when we got in those days rec independent record companies still gave advances to bands and we'd get a few thousand pounds to record an album so uh when we did the hidden agenda album in 1993 i just put the money into getting the rest of the kit that i needed to uh, and then actually i paid the studio engineer from the local studio we'd been to before because I thought oh, I don't, I'm not good enough, you know, <clears throat> at that stage. So, uh, and we did that first album, at, you know, in my, well, it was a bedroom, and it gradually 
where I used to rent a room and it, it just turned into a studio <laughs> with a mattress in the corner. Yeah. Probably yeah. zoned up a few bass frequencies. So we did that. And then after that, it was great because I could do remixes for people and remixes for me and extra tracks and other projects. It just meant it just opened things up. And <laughs> I know nowadays everyone can do that. Everyone can do it on their computer. But in those days, well, I had a computer, but it was an Atari and it only did MIDI. I uh, eventually got a little tape machine. So, yeah, it was really good days for that. And then... Um, and then really just I went, a lot of my stuff I had we started obviously with hardware and then gradually it went more software as that all improved in the 90s and 2000s uh, and I really got I really embraced that I kept some analog stuff but I, I regrettably sold some things <laughs> I think mm -hmm. everyone regrets selling their favorite analog sin wasn't it? Um, and then lately, there's been a lot more cheap hardware equipment coming out and loads of, uh, and I've got back into that and that all syncs together now. It works much better than it used to. Uh, and yeah, and then I, I converted here at my house here, I converted the attic to be a purpose built room, you know. So uh, it is a home studio, but it's a good one. And so, yeah, I've got lots of toys. And uh, as much as that, though, it's having different, you know, three sets of audio monitors and sound-treated room and all those things help a lot. But I do a lot of mastering, so that's kind of, that's vital for, for that. So, And it's just, I was just doing it all the time. That's what I do full mm -hmm. time. Yeah. I, I did used to teach music technology for, I did 16 years part-time at the college here. I set up a course. And uh, that was good. They used to pay me to go on American tours for staff development. Fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, stop doing that. <laughs> There's no money. But yeah, that was a good time. That was in like, the night, late 90s and 2000. So, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, it's just a, like the new album. I think it's just I spent a lot of time on it and uh, I kind of know what I'm doing. You know, I still, I'm still. I still think I'm just learning really a lot of things, but mm. that's a good that's a good way to be, I think. Well, I, I think in a lot of ways, uh technology today has led to an ease of use for a lot yeah. of things that were, you know, very difficult. Well, not difficult necessarily, but very time consuming, say thirty years ago. Um yeah. as an example, I your your band camp page for attrition is yeah pretty voluminous there's a lot of material there that's available so yeah you've embraced kind of the 2024 model of of say marketing one's work um and you mentioned something in your previous answer about you know um anyone can do certain things and that's certainly true but i also think that adds a layer of challenge in being a recording artist in 2024, because everybody can do it. You know, like for example, yeah. this conversation, this has kind of become the way interviews are done now. Whereas I spent 20 years as a full on writer for magazines and, you know, elsewhere. Um, so with that sort of preamble, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on some of the greatest advantages and maybe greatest challenges to, where we all are in 2024 as far as marketing a new album and, and trying to be, you know, if you look at the internet as a massive cornfield, being the one man band with the crash symbol, sort of trying to get. Yeah. The... It's yeah. Um, in fact, we, we did an old, uh, old fashioned interview at the gig uh, just after the sound check on Friday here with, you know, with the magazine and we all just sat around a table and that was great because that's true. It doesn't happen quite so much um not now but it's it's yeah i have there's some things i'm we're talking about then actually that because i started off i used to do a fanzine before i ever did attrition for i just wanted to do music but i was an art student i didn't know anything i i dropped out of music at school because it was i just thought it was rubbish and i've probably done more albums i, was, I couldn't do it because it was all traditional you know and i probably made more albums than anyone that ever went to that school but um, but I did a fanzine to start with, and it was great because you've got a network of people that are still doing music today, a lot of them. 
um, and wrote about it. So I got it, it gave me a bit of a step into the industry actually. Uh, and it was in the time in Coventry when the, when Two Tone and the specials was just breaking, you know, obviously they're from here. And I, I knew them a bit and I'd interview them. So it was actually a good place to be, even though musically it wasn't for me. <laughs> for attrition it wasn't. I should have been in Sheffield or something with all the bands up there, you know, like, you know, uh, Clock DBA and Cabaret Voltaire. I should have been up there in a way. But... It was it was a good time, but I got used to just doing my own networking and marketing. Uh, and then when the band start, when attrition started, I was doing the same, sending cassettes and doing little flyers and just that whole. There was a real boom in independent bands doing all that, and I learned that then. And then eventually it went to bigger labels. Generally, I kept it going as well. Sometimes I remember leaving it to the label for one album and I really regretted it because I felt I wasn't involved. I didn't get any contact with people. Um, so I went back I and mean, I've always had that. And I think after the sort of the way the music industry almost collapsed 20 years ago with illegal downloading and what have you, uh, it did. And everyone got depressed and most bands were going, oh, God, what's the point? You know, and it was there was a lot of that wasn't there like back then and then it came back with more like vinyl and even fanzines came back printed ones and came back more uh more hands-on and personal um uh, like it used to be i think things maybe got a bit a bit too plastic boxy and corporate uh you know and it it was it was fine I and mean, we used to sell a lot of cds but um it lost some of that magic and I think it's come back in a lot of ways, but I'm used to that. So I like, I do that uh, physically, you know, sending things out, but obviously the internet came along in the meantime and uh, that gives you another opportunity to do things. And Bandcamp's brilliant. It's, uh, uh, you know, I went through, I went through lots of old live tapes, for instance, from the eighties. And I thought, well, I mean, if they're going to throw these out or put them up for people to listen to, and as long as they weren't really terrible recordings, which one to were, <clears throat> I did a lot of that. I just spent time mastering them and putting them up with some photos. And, you know, people, they, they, they like them. It's nice that they're there, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm into that. That's all good. And there's like, there's other sites as well, but... Um, there is the problem now, though, with a kind of digital overload, where every, like you say, everybody's doing it, and that that one man band trying to get attention is difficult. I mean, people put an album out. I've heard, I met some people who are going, "Oh, I've got thirty albums on Bandcamp," and they haven't ever done a gig, and they haven't really, they've probably never even done an interview, but they just put them up, and yeah. they go, "Oh, yeah. everyone's interested," and I said, "Well." That's just a needle in the haystack, you know. It's like nobody knows about you, uh, and that's that's the modern world, isn't it? Um, or you put it up for streaming, I suppose, is, is more of a thing now. But um, that is a thing that you need to sort of stand out from all of that. Um, I still think doing tours and gigs is one of the best ways because that's actually real life, isn't it? It's yeah. IRA, as I say. Um, uh, but and also we, I have got a certain advantage in that people know me from the past. So, so for me that does help a bit, and I've got a, quite a good contact list. And stuff. So, uh, yeah, you know that helps. But it is, it is hard, and I think there, there used to be people like John Peel who would, you know, he would be, it was a, you know, everyone listened to John Peel. It was just amazing, really sad. He used to play us, you know, in the eighties, and it was. It was just fantastic, and it, and everyone would take notice. It's kind of like what they'd call influencers of today, but the influencers today tend to just be annoying. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not totally true, but you know what I mean. It's like people yeah. that go on TikTok and dance up and down with a cat or something. Um, but yeah, we. But I think there used to be that filter of, of bands, and so you didn't get so many. Um, in a lot of ways, independent music broke open those barriers, but it let a whole floodwater in of, you know, and it's not always good 
<laughs> people drown. But yeah, it's uh, it's a different world, but there's a lot of it that's still the same, really. So I mean, I've done so much, spent so many hours since this announced the album a few weeks ago, doing uh, interviews and sending promos to DJs and uh, or whatever journalists, you know. Yeah. yeah. Promoters, every, you know, the whole thing. And I've been doing hours every day. And I'm like, I thought, I'm having a day off today. And I thought, oh, no, I'm not, because I'm doing this interview. <laughs> but actually, it's good. Of course, it's nice to do a face to face. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, to jump off some of what you've just said and, and kind of take a long walk to my next question, um, yeah. I, I'm old enough to have had some ex experience in the previous culture let's say where even when i was before i was a teenager i was doing a xerox fanzine myself oh, you know yeah and cool. went from there to adulthood early adulthood going through college got a job actually running a physical printed paper music magazine you know oh. that was my first job out of school and i mentioned this um because when i got that job one of the first things I did was contact some friends I knew in the industry um, through various methods um, to say, hey, I'm doing this. Send me your stuff. So I, I called um, Martin Atkins at Invisible yeah. Records, who I've known since like 1993. And I said, hey, I'm doing this magazine. Send me a bunch of your current releases. I'll do a feature on you know the current state of Invisible Records. OK, yeah. Yeah, so we did that, and one of the releases was uh, Christian, The Hand That Feeds, uh, the remix. Oh, the remix record. one, that was, yeah. Yeah, so oddly enough, my first my first written piece as a writer who was writing and paying bills, <laughs> being yeah. a writer for a music magazine, um, that piece included attrition. So um, oh, I'll right. have to go through some boxes, but if I find it, I'll send you a scan of it. Is that yeah, I mean, I might even have it if I'd... If I'd if martin maybe sent things or whatever i don't know that's actually that's pre-internet though isn't it so yeah this would have been just uh, about actually it was it was internet ish this was oh, okay just as it started though and also you started a bit before here america got into it a bit quicker than uk yeah so. yeah. yeah but this was actually a a magazine that was an actual thing you can hold in your hands believe it or not um, but I yeah. mentioned all of that because not only it does it tie into what we've been discussing, but you, um, as well as myself, we've been part of the pig face experience. Yeah, yeah, because I didn't realize that till you told me. Yeah, because there's been so many. Yes, it's understandable. <laughs> and your uh, you appear on the pig face album called Six. Six, yeah. Uh, and you sing um, one of my all-time favorite Pig Face songs, uh, a track called Dulcimer, um, which I would describe as a, you know, a, a two-word description, uh, beautifully sinister. Um, oh. I love that track. Um, so how did that collaboration come to be where you ended up working with um, Martin and Bradley and, and Ori and the other contributors to that number? Yeah. Well, I didn't know everyone because we all sent our bits together, you know, so it was like, I, I, I'm i assuming, I think Martin mixed it all and he, I, I know he did, yeah. But, um, I mean, I met Martin, he's actually from near here, I'm in Coventry in this, this, this Midlands, of centre of the UK, and he was from Nuneaton originally, which is eight miles north of here. Mm. Um, and then he was, he was in the States since, I think, Pill days in the, but then he came back for a while because his his dad wasn't very well and he moved over with his kids for but this was 20 years ago easily so he was here for a while and he had his studio and he was doing damage manual uh, and that's when i um, a friend knew him and that's when i got to know him so we'd go and you know, hang out and then uh, we we'd been on project records uh in the states uh, but then Martin asked if we'd like to do, and the thing projects very much more gothic kind of music, and I always like, oh uh, yeah, they sort of like attrition, but I never feel gothic. Saying that, my house is very gothic, but that's that's not my music, is it? <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I thought, yeah, that's good, and said so that's much more industrial, and I, I thought that'd be cool to be with his label. So we did 
uh, he did reissue some things as well um, that had never been released in the States. Uh, and we did. And then we did Dante's Kitchen, that album, 2004. But Hand That Feeds was before that. I think that was 2000 or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, wasn't there a Nine Inch Nails record called The Hand That Feeds that came out afterwards? I remember. I oh, there was. Sure there was, but uh, I haven't got it. It's just it was after mine, and I thought oh, that's strange because he knows Martin. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, they just I don't care. Really. But um, yeah, so we did that. So basically, yeah, so I got to know Martin, and that's when we did did those records, and we did he did arrange for a couple of tours for us. In we did one in two thousand, and they helped a bit with that, and then two thousand and. Well, it was actually January 2005 when just after the Dante's Kitchen one, we did another one. Um, and then and that was it, really. We didn't we didn't do any more with him after that. But, uh, actually, uh, the pig face would have come out a bit after that, wouldn't it? I think I don't remember what year it came out. I want to say it was 2009 around there. It, 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 it would be a bit later, years. yeah, because although we didn't do we didn't do a new album with martin but we because we went back to project for a, a bit but we did some tracks and remix things and different bits still sort of kept still in touch a bit but yeah it was something it was a bit later wasn't it? i think also it came out of, i did that track and then it was a while till it came out uh but yeah it was yeah like all the pig face it's a big co collaboration of lots of people isn't it so yeah. uh it was it what were you which what did you do which ones were you involved with uh originally 2001 right uh the 10th anniversary tour um i i just did one show for that tour in new york um yeah. is i was in new jersey at the time right outside the lincoln tunnel um so i did the limelight with them and then there was this whole stretch of time where Pigface did a couple of tours after that, but they were on hiatus for a long time because Martin was teaching. Yeah. Um, and then when he conceptualized the 25th anniversary shows, he invited me back for those, which was wonderful because it had been years since I had done it. And then subsequent to that, 2019, I did a part mm -hmm. of that as well. Um, never did studio work with them. I, I'm on the, the last live album he put out. Yeah. Uh, big face but you know it's always interesting it's um you know you, you don't have to throw a stone very far to to hit somebody who's done big face you know i know <laughs> <laughs> but i didn't get i never did a live thing you didn't, didn't actually ask me so i'm really hurt actually but no not really but um no it was good it was nice to be involved with it absolutely like i said i love yeah. that number that's uh you know, right up, right up my alley. That's certainly my speed. That kind of mood. On yeah, that cool. Yeah, I like it really. But I say I didn't. We I did some electronics and voc and the vocals, obviously, and then my singer at the time, Laurie, did the female vocals. But then some of the other bits were I can't remember what I put with it. It's quite a while ago. But mm. there was yeah, obviously there was I guess Martin and whoever else did things. So it came out. It did. It was all sounded good in the end. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, going back a bit further in history, um, I wanted to mention something that um, occurred really in the early years of attrition. Um, you ended up having a track on the Crash Records compilation bullshit. Yeah, I'm just, did, you, did you know it's my mug? Can you see it? That's fantastic. Yeah, especially blue, actually. It was a one-off. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, that's a good coincidence, isn't it? Absolutely, and I, I, I've interviewed <laughs> Steve and Penny, and 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 Penny in particular is a deeply fascinating human being. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, obviously, I love Crass because we were on on the Bullshit Detectors Volume Three, the compilations of new bands. How uh, and what's interesting about that particular volume that you're on is it's also um the recorded debut of napalm death um, i know they, and then i knew them because they were from actually the, just the original lineup was from actually virtually coventry just a village outside coventry and they used to come 
used to buy my fanzine <laughs> and they were like 12 years old they i mean they left i think they did the first few things and left them. It, before it became more as sort of metal as it did but but yeah they they had the track the track next to us on the album it's uh, kind of nice uh, but they, you know they've just re-released that series, the Bullshit Detector. Right? Um, yeah, just in the last year. Last or two, year, right? yeah, yeah, which is good. So, uh, but I mean, our track was always on our on a you know we reissued it a few years later anyway on a collection. But yeah, no, I love Crass. I, there's uh, I went to see them in I think it was '79 or something in the play near here, and. Uh, there's, they've got a, an exhibition of their art, uh, crass art, in in London next month. So, uh, um, I think that'll be fascinating. So I'm going to go to that. Fantastic uh, for, for crass now. <laughs> yeah. So, how did that connection with them come to be? Where you ended up on the compilation? Was it a matter of them asking for demos, or was it um, a situation where you knew those guys already, and that's how it? I didn't. I didn't know them. Uh, it was just. I don't know if they asked for bands, but it was because there was Bullshit Detector 1 and 2. I, I'm not sure exactly. The 3 came out in 1984, but I, I think 1 must have come out in 82 because I you, you always got the address. It was Dial House. You know, you always got the address on any... I had all their records. And um, I just sent them a demo in, in 82, actually. So I... Um, yeah, because they weren't in the music press that much. Because they were, you know, they weren't, you know, they were a bit too extreme for a lot of the uh, more. Even though they'd write about punk bands, they I think they found Crass a bit too full on. So uh, it was. I, I would have just written to them because the address was there, and and then two years late, you know, two years later they said, "Yeah, we're going to use it," and it's like, "Oh wow!" And it was just when our first album was coming out then. Uh, but I loved it that they put us on because I totally have that view that, and you know, I I love what they said and I still do. Um, but we weren't trashy punk. But actually, in the end, they weren't either just that, were they? They were a lot more than that. Just the very beginning they were. Uh, but it was great that we were on there and we weren't trashy punk. And I thought that was that was actually, you know, fantastic. Because it's it's not just about the sound, is it? It's about the feeling and what you're saying. I remember the first time I went to LA in '94, and I went over. I went to Project Records to uh, remaster our first three albums that were on vinyl, so we could remaster them to be reissued on CD for, for pro, on Project. And I went out to a club. I can't remember what the club was like. You know, a sort of alternative club in LA. And there was a guy came up to me. Because he, people had said that I was there, and they came up, and he's like, "You were on Bullshit Detector," and he was like the biggest Crass fan with a tattoo, and everything. <laughs> it was like, "Wow, that's fantastic!" That I didn't even know how, because they weren't in the mainstream the same at all, even though they actually sold a lot of records. But um, it was just great to see how they did get, you know, they, their name did get out there. So yeah, fantastic. And, I mean, it's a long. It's forty years ago since they split up, which is crazy. Um, so I've actually mastered one or two of Penny's solo, experimental sort of jazzy ambient albums um, uh, over the years. You know, a few years since I did the last one. So that was uh, that was great to do that. Yeah, interesting guy, certainly. Um still very much someone who um keeps the ball in the air you know and has a lot of interesting ideas and things to say yeah. he never lost his his sense of what he was doing you know his sense of purpose is still very strong even now yeah yeah i think so yeah i mean steve's doing the songs of crass and he tours i know he goes to the states as well i've seen one of those and it was great i got i got a bit of a tear in my eye you know but it was it's it's just him, for, but it's still great, you know. It was, yeah, it was it was really busy as well. I've been to, I've been to, actually I've been three times over the years to see him do it on his own. But yeah, fair play to them. Big influence to me actually. Um, that's the thing. I always get called goth, and I'm always saying, "No, I'm not. Stop it." 
<laughs> and uh, yeah. really, I'm an old punk rocker, you know. I always will be. But I just have to like sort of dark sounds as well. Well, it's all a state of mind, is it? You know, isn't it? It's not. You know, it's not about the aesthetic. It's about the mindset. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, it, it to my mind, it makes absolute sense that attrition would be on the bullshit detector next to nap napalm death, next to yeah. you know, the other stuff on there. You know, it's it's absolutely perfect. You know, it's yeah. it. Absolutely. Know, I'm really pleased with it. The other one I'm really pleased with it was the Animal Liberation album. It was on Wax Tracks uh, in '87, and that that uh, with like um, Nina Hagen and uh, uh, the Smiths were on it. Although I don't mention them these days because of the singer, but uh, at the time, great. And you know, there was a. Uh, who else was on it? Susie on the British version. I don't think it was on the American. And it was pulled, put together by Al Jorgensen, did it all. And uh, there was uh, Colourfield with Terry Hall from the specials, his band. It was a really big album, actually. And we did we played the launch in London, actually, when it came out. And, uh, oh, Chris and Cozy and uh, Nina Hagen and Lena Lovich. It was, it was brilliant. So that was another one I was really pleased about. Yeah, I still yeah. have that on cassette actually here. Yeah, right. Yeah. It should be that'd be nice to be reissued, but I don't know. It's probably too big. The names are quite big, so. Uh, it's probably I would imagine without knowing a thing about it, could be like a licensing thing. That's you know? what I think. I imagine it would be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it was great at the time. Yeah, it was because uh, we our first single was called "Monkey in a Bin," which was like an anti-vivisection song again it really influenced by all the anarchist punk things and um it was i mean i became vegetarian at first before i became vegan and that was hearing flux of pink indian song on crass records uh sick butchers and that i thought this is right and i was vegetarian within about a week i had to figure it out <laughs> and that was in 1981 i think that one so yeah uh so it was great we, that was a big thing we, we did quite a few you know, we did a bit some protests and uh, demos for animal rights and back in those days. Uh, so, yeah, that was great. You know, like, uh, don't, I don't do it so much now, but I still, obviously, I do still, that's still my belief and I still do, uh, I do push it occasionally. Yeah. I just, I can't do the same single again, you know, I can't do this if, once you've said it, you know. Mm, but that yeah. was one John Peel played quite a bit. But, well, it came out in 84. Attrition is making plans to come out to the States to perform a cold waves. In yes, yeah. So you'll be out this, you know, out in Chicago waves. Yeah, because we haven't been for ages. We used to do a lot in the 90s and up to 2008, really. And then we didn't. It just got quite difficult to get there. And they, I don't know why. But it was expensive and it just, we didn't have a good agent. We tried a couple of times, actually. Uh, and I used to go to Canada more. But we used, we just went all over the world, actually, like Japan and New Zealand, and South America, and Europe, of course. So it's nice to come back, actually. So people seem quite excited about that as well. Um, so we've, we're hoping to add more dates as well. So, um, but yeah, that's that's confirmed. That's, uh, well, they're advertising it as well, so. That's all confirmed for September, the end of last weekend of September. That is. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a fantastic event. You'll have a great time there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And our first show actually in America was in Chicago in 96. It was a Project Records Festival, Project Fest. And we, uh, that, yeah, that was the first one we ever did at the, uh, the Vic Theatre, quite a big theatre. So, kind of like come full circle almost to do that um yeah so i'm really looking forward to that <clears throat> and we've got some of the festivals in europe and that before then but, uh, yeah great. busy well it, it, that's great and it, it kind of leads to my my final question in that yeah um you know attrition has existed um since 1980 so yeah we're, we're looking at well over 40 years and you know when i speak with an artist who has that kind of uh length 
uh, in their career. Um, I, you know, I, I tend to ask with, with so much in the rear view and you've put out a tremendous amount of music over the years, um, yeah. you've built your studio, you've got the new record, you've got festivals in the here and now. Um, uh, what do you consider to be the greatest thing that attrition has yet to accomplish after all this time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think it's, it isn't a thing. I don't sort of go, I don't really, I mean, I go, yeah, there's a new album or let's arrange some gigs or something, but that's just what you do. That's walking and breathing. But uh, I think it's just, it's the excitement. I still have the excitement of feeling like I've just started writing it's all about expressing yourself in a way that you can never do by talking or everyday life. It's the, <clears throat> it's a much, uh, I don't know if extreme is the right word, it kind of is. It's a way, it, more, pure, I think is a better word, of uh, any art is a pure way of human beings to express themselves because it, it says so much more than conversation or um and that's why that's why it's hard to describe often, I think, because it's more than you can describe. Um, and I think it's just it's just that what I'm always like looking to. I go, I know I can do something better. I know I need to do I need to do more, you know. And I think that's it. It's just that it's like maybe it's chasing a rainbow, you know. I, I think it's it's uh, yeah. You'll never find you'll never quite get it but you'll get nearer each time i think that's it yeah it's nothing tangible but it is you know what i mean yeah oh yeah. Absolutely. absolutely um well i will say that this current album is is an accomplishment in reaching the unattainable um it's a fantastic work um I, i'm so happy to connect with you uh almost a quarter century after I first wrote about you. Yeah, so, it's mad, uh, isn't it? It's like, I love that thing about the music business as well. I'll meet people that we toured with or we had some connection with, like you say, 25 years ago. And you're just, you're just friends and you meet again and you just, and I thought you don't get that if you were working in a bank with them 25 years ago. <laughs> right. But right. It's, it's a connection, isn't it? It's that whole thing that that's, what, that's because that's what music does. And you feel like and another you feel like you know people, don't you, that you've never met sometimes. Oh because, you, because they've expressed themselves to you that you you know, and anybody in the street can't or wouldn't. So you feel closer. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. That's I think why um in large part we do what we do because music heals, it, it connects, yeah. you know. Um and and you connect in ways far deeper than a typical chat with a bank teller or something you know it's yeah it's yeah much more significant yeah definitely yeah um so i i thank you for creating music that you know makes makes me connect to what you're doing in a deeper way um the album is called the black mariah i i would strongly encourage anyone watching this video if you haven't checked out the album to certainly do so and if you're logistically able Come out to Chicago in September and see attrition as part of cold waves. That's going to be a fantastic time. Yeah, it will. I look forward to it. Excellent. Martin, thank you so much for connecting with me. Um, until we meet again, uh, all yeah. the best. Thanks, and Joe. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. And we'll have to do this again sometime soon. Yeah, sure. Okay. Fantastic. Bye. Take care, my friend.